from rural Indian places by generating entrepreneurship at the village level. Under his leadership, the Uttarakhand state has been recognized several times by Ministry of New and Renewable Energy and Bureau of Energy Efficiency for their outstanding effort in renewable energy and energy efficiency, respectively. During the calamity disaster in Uttarakhand, he has led the team and ensured the restoration of electricity supply. So, with this note, I would like to invite Tagi sir, please. We can go with presentation. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I request to uh, make the presentation. So, kindly share my presentation. Everybody can see the slide? Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. See. Okay. Good afternoon. So the, uh, the main content of uh, today, my lecture is socio economic and environmental aspect of small, mini and micro hydro, hydro projects uh, concept. Next. These, uh, the, these are the main content uh, of my topic. Socio economic and environmental impact. In which uh, positive socio economic impact. And positive environmental impact. And also positive impact of small, mini, micro hydro projects. And also, there are some negative environmental impact of small micro hydro project also. And what are the benefits, uh, environmental versus socio-economic benefits uh, we can uh, see uh, from these projects. And also, the involvement of community for small projects, micro level projects and also the capacity building activities at local level. And finally, we will discuss a case study of our uh, project that has been installed in 1995 in Uttarakhand. So these are the main contact of, um, of my uh, today's lecture. Next. <clears throat> So if we compare the large hydropower project with micro level or small size project, we can see a very low negative environmental and socio-economic impact is there. In various studies on small, mini and micro hydro projects, and supply of electric, electricity through these projects. In off-grid or on-grid mode, the very less negative environmental and socio-economic impact was found. In, in off-grid renewable energy applications like solar power plants, wind based projects and biomass based projects we we have we have find that micro hydro projects also have a variety of direct and indirect positive impacts which are often interrelated next now what are the positive socio economic impact we found by installing a mini or micro level hydro projects. When we installed a 
a small project for providing electricity to the villages. We find that number of small cottages, industries, agro processing units, shops, mills, opens by the villagers, thus enhance the income generation. So whenever you installed a micro level project to provide electricity to the villagers, after some time, you will find that lot of micro level industry come up and they will generate income also. Other positive socio-economic impact was there is lot of saving on expenses on kerosene, gasoline, candles and, and batteries. A lot of villagers are being used battery for lighting their houses. So this expenses they will save when they get electricity from micro hydro projects. Income increase and saving as well as the possibility to use refrigeration, improve the diet and thus decrease malnutrition and hunger. This shows that whenever you get the electricity, you will use refrigeration unit so your health and diet also improve other socio-economic impact is women and children's workload decrease because they are wasting lot of time for collection of firewood or water gathering from the nearby area. When they get electricity in their houses, the workload will decrease and they will spend less time on energy related household tasks. Other positive socio-economic impact is uh, the community safety in general improve, improves due to street light at night. Whenever micro level hydro project has been installed in a village that provide electricity throughout the day and night and they will get street light at night also. Telecommunication is enhanced. So after getting electricity, the telecommunication facilities will also uh, increase. People get more aware of the outside world, which gives them more knowledge also. So these are the positive socio-economic impact uh, that was found in various studies carried out on mini and micro hydro projects. Next. The micro hydro projects raises the awareness of proper watershed management and reforestation to secure the sustainable use of water sources. Moreover, the plant contribute to protect the environment and combat climate change through reduce use of kerosene, gasoline and small battery to, and also reduce the carbon emission that causes due to burning of kerosene and candles. Next. Now, there are some of the positive impact of small, mini, micro hydro projects in terms of uh, various um, activities like and poverty and hunger. 
if in a village a small micro hydro projects installed that generate electricity that can be useful for agro processing and a small service business like mills shops which generate jobs and income some of the villagers they find employment in their village itself through cottage industries and small business within the village decrease expenditure on purchase of candles and kerosene food processing and refrigeration allows an improvement of diet contributing to reduction of hunger and malnutrition so these are the end poverty and hunger related positive impact second is universal education whenever a village having the electricity through the decentralized generated power due to the electricity supplied by this micro hydro projects student can study during evening hours and spend less time in in energy related activities such as collection of firewood or gathering getting the water from outside the village power supply in school attracts teacher to rural areas and allows use of multimedia tools like they can start online classes or they can use other means of social media to teach the students next third is the gender equality micro hydro projects generated electricity can reduce the time females spent on household tasks such as collection of firewood fuel wood therefore they have more time to study and become literate other job traditionally reserved to women such as shopkeeper or craft work may improve with the access to electricity lot of women have skill to do some household jobs like knitting crafting so they can use their skill after getting electricity from the micro hydro plant public lighting improved public safety in rural community this is the main major benefit or positive impact that women are getting after installation of micro hydro projects in a village safety from wild animals in rural area that are being faced by women when they are taking fuel wood from the forest from the um, 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 from the forest land many time wild any animals arms the women so after public lighting public safety in rural community has increased next fourth is child health maternal health is also 
comes under the positive impact of small mini micro hydro projects. Hydro project decreases indoor air pollution of kerosene, gasoline, smoke and candle and improves safety around the houses. Presently, where there is no electricity, the villages are being used, candles or batteries in their houses to illumination or also using the kerosene in the night time that produce smoke. So that is very harmful for child health. So after getting electricity from micro idle projects, the air pollution within the house will decrease. Also, the better diet and more hygienic cooking condition environment has been created in the houses. Mothers and children can benefit from improved medical services also. Because there is no pollution, no carbon emission in their houses now after getting electricity from micro hydro projects. The electricity supplied by the micro hydro projects enable refrigeration, adequate lighting, telecommunication, and use of medical technology, which in turn permit vaccination, sterilization, and an improvement in time and quality of medical services. These are the positive impact with related to the child health and maternal health. Electricity supply also allows the use of groundwater pump, thus waterborne disease due to contaminated surface water can be decreased. So this is also a health related aspect, positive impact of small hydro projects. Next. Next is the environmental sustainability. Micro hydro projects contribute to the environmental sustainability and combat climate change through reduce use of kerosene, gasoline and small batteries. Because all these are generating carbon and smoke inside the houses. Additionally, there is an increased awareness of the importance of a proper watershed management and reforestation to secure long term water resources. So these are the environmental sustainability positive impact of micro and mini hydro projects. And also the global partnership. MH micro hydro projects improve the access to information and telecommunication uh, like uh, operating TV, radio, mobile phones, and also connect with social media. There are crucial inputs for raising awareness and allowing the creation of network and interest groups. Online classes uh, also uh, will be beneficial uh, at globally. Next. There are some negative environmental impact also our uh, one friend asking question from single sir about uh, the environmental impact of uh, micro level projects uh, since no large re reservoir are required no resettlement programs and the long going negative impacts for the population occur 
since micro hydro project scheme do not require a reservoir and divert only part of the stream water away from a portion of the river to power the turbine they only have little impact on flora and fauna of the municipality so you will find that uh, very little impact on the flora and fauna uh, of, of the area of that area of that river is affect in terms of negative environmental however they tend to create small shallow pools which can cause problems such as sedimentation as well as anthropification and can thus affect water quality and lead to greenhouse gas emission there are some small ponds shallow pools are uh, developed um, nearby the power house and other things so the some greenhouse gas can be um, can affect the water quality uh, of the of that area particularly a decrease of water quality can furthermore cause water borne disease and thus affect the health situation of the population so these are uh, the negative environment impact but not uh, in, in in a major uh, portion in comparison to the large hydro because there is no resettlement is required there is not uh, 100% uh, uh, diversion of water is required you have to uh, left the environmental uh, minimum environmental flow uh, in the river so uh, very less impact of uh, flora and fauna on this uh, uh, micro hydro projects next uh, due to the micro hydro uh, projects and along going electricity supply a population growth close to the powerhouse is likely to occur uh in some time uh, when there is a powerhouse so some habitation has come up near the power powerhouse they uh, started uh, constructing their houses there near house so uh, pressure on natural resources and risk of erosion in area close to the powerhouse is increased this can be happen if uh, your powerhouse location is very uh, um, uh, very good so some sometime the some villages can come up nearby the powerhouse uh, in near, near future and they can uh, increase negative environment impact due to the erosion of areas close to the powerhouse further environmental impact might be Deep, due to the deforestation due to the construction of access road and grid connection power lines so these are uh, also a negative environmental impact but very in in very less uh, situation next now we will uh, see the environmental versus socio economic benefits so uh, we can take question now or uh, after the finishing of lecture can anybody suggest uh, i think sagar is raising and please could you ask the question Oh, no 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 tola sir oh, okay okay sir you, you you can go sir okay okay so uh, what are the, the environmental versus socio economic benefits so there are some negative or positive environmental uh, aspects versus socio economic benefits so these are some of the, the main uh, we have noticed from various uh, case studies and the 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 projects already installed and working in con working condition it should be noted that uh, from uh, this we have noticed that some feature might be considered positive in socio economic terms 
but negative in environmental terms and vice versa. Uh, you will find uh, some negative and positive in terms of environmental and social economic benefits. So taking the construction of axis road, for example, it has negative impact on the environment. Since increased deforestation occurs due to positive social economic effect in terms of increase access to the market. And in some area increase income from tourism. So you will find that. If a road is constructed nearby the powerhouse or uh, the plant. That impact negative on the environmental point of view, but. Positive socioeconomic effect also there that people can come to the um, that area uh, for for a uh, from tourism um, point of view or or the or the other uh, uh, point of view because they they have access the road like uh, other uh, other scheme impact of health situation can be taken as an example the plant environmental impact such as decreased water quality might affect population health nevertheless the electricity supply might also improve the overall health situation so you can find that environmental impact versus social impact benefit also uh, cover uh, in this in this uh, slide due to the refrigeration improved access and decreased income to purchase medicine if we use the refrigeration system they they will have a overall health good health and less expenditure on the purchase of medicine so this is socio economic benefit is there but some negative impact is also uh, there Generally, negative impact should be kept to a minimum by incorporating and implementing respective mitigation techniques already in the planning and construction phase of MHP projects. Next. Uh, now, if you want to construct a small, mini, or micro uh, hydro projects in your uh, country or in your area. There are some. Permissions or clearances. Required. From different uh, department. If we see in India context. The following clearances or permission is required before development of small hydro projects. Uh, first is state pollution control board to get the permission from pollution uh, department. And if you are using. Forest land. In micro hydel uh, projects, then you have to. Take. Forest clearance from forest department. And if you are using water that is being used for irrigation purpose in in uh, other villages in the uh, down side of uh, the powerhouse, so you have to take permission from irrigation department also. Minor irrigation is also uh, providing permission for use using water for generating electricity. If you are. Constructing a project. Nearby. The roadside. You have to take permission from public works department. Before construction of a project. If in downside of the diversion. You have. 
to take permission from fisheries department if any fisheries activity is being carried out there if any eco task force is working in that area you have to take permission from that eco task force to construct a small mini or micro hydel projects in that area if there are villages villages using the water for drinking purposes you have to take permission from drinking water departments also next next now jal sansthan is in in our case jal sansthan is the uh, uh, body who are using drinking water and providing permission for construction of micro hydro projects if you are using gram panchayat land or private land you have to take permission from gram panchayat there should be a written resolution from gram panchayat for giving consent to use the their land you have to take permission from agriculture department also if uh, some agriculture activities or agriculture land is to be used for uh, construction of uh, project other departments are uh, public health department if uh, some uh, some activities is going on there noc from forest dwellers rights act this is now mandatory for forest clearances permission for use of explosives if you want to use the explosive uh, in that area so you have to take permission from explosive department if you are using crusher at site you have to take permission from district uh, uh, authority and uh, also if you are constructing project in a tribal or in a uh, protected area you have to take permission from the tribal affair department so these are the um, various permission or clearances required before construction of a small mini and um, micro hydro projects uh, in any uh, area in india so but you can get uh, easily all the permission uh, because uh, some of the department have not uh, any activities in their that area so they they just give uh, permission from within a week or 10 days next now for capacity development activities for scaling up energy access program we have classified seven main activities under functional and technical capacity that are planning oversight and monitoring like if you want to install a micro hydro projects there you have to plan you have to take uh, basic data from that area like uh, number of households you have to calculate the load forecasting availability of local resources so these are come under the planning oversight and monitoring uh, chapter and also you have to take knowledge of policies and regulation 
so there should be a clear policy and regulation for construction and operation maintenance of the small mini and micro hydro projects in off grid or on grid mode like in india or in uttarakhand uh, we have a regulation we have a tariff levelized tariff already defined by the regulatory body so before going to construct uh, hydro projects you have to your uh, your government has to declare the policies and regulation for this the situation analysis is we have to check the availability available site ownership of land clearances what are the clearances required to uh, the land uh, location uh, the sliding zone there should be a stakeholder dialogue also before uh, taking decision you have to discuss with the local community there communication and community mobilization so these are the stakeholder di uh, stakeholder dialogues because local villages know everything like uh, what are the maximum flood level of a of an stream so you will ask from the local villagers that what is the maximum water level in your in 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 the past history then that villagers can tell you the level the highest level due to the flood so you before choosing the site before finalizing the site you have to take stakeholder stakeholder dialogues there setting up and enhancing institutions so you have to choose the technical uh, technical uh, um, expertise there monitoring availability of resources uh, fund availability and after that the training of community members and program implementers so you have to make a plan to train the community members and technicians and operators for for operation and maintenance of these plants and finally the implementation and management plan uh, in this the schedule of construction time and the permission all required the uh, the third party inspection quality checking that also cover under this implementation and management uh, plan next so these are the lesson to renewable energy projects for local rural development uh because micro level projects are very small so we have to uh involve community for planning construction operation and maintenance of uh, these plants so there should be involvement and active participation of local in is crucial in promoting and providing momentum in implementation of distributed power generation activities first of all you have to educate local villages that you are going to construct a uh, hydro projects for their benefit they are, they will get electricity they will get employment and also they have the income
other is involving the private sector effectively requires flexibility to keep up the phase phase of decentralized development procurement policies and approach business model financing and disbursement parameters because you can also involve private sector for development of micro hydro projects in terms of uh, operation and maintenance or capital uh, recovery mode or in in renewable energy service company mode uh, that can be um, many um, many mode are there available uh, and appro appropriate feed in tariff policy and its consistent and transparent applications are crucial to increase growth of small scale and non conventional renewable energy generation so there should be a uh, clear cut feed in tariff policy should be there otherwise when you want to convert a, an off grid project into on grid project you have to take permission to synchronize the your plant into the grid of the uh, utility so if there is no policy there so you can't synchronize your plant into the grid the expansion of the grid should be coordinated with off grid investment and where warrant warranted the off grid facilities should be made grid compatibility to ensure their continued utility uh, in last session uh, somebody uh, is asking that uh, in from nepal uh, i think from nepal uh, they are asking that uh, the off grid project is now uh, being different because they have not uh, any policy or any Uh, any program to convert them from off grid to on grid so in this regard we will discuss uh, in, in later slide that we have in uttarakhand uh, in india we have uh, made a many different type of uh, plant uh, off grid plant into the on grid plant convert uh, off grid plant into on grid plants so we will discuss later next now why local participation is must in small mini and micro hydro projects we have to involve community now the question arises that how to involve as community being made partners first of all local community being made partner being given responsibility like construction operation and maintenance of small uh, micro hydro projects having clearly defined rights like ownership the ownership if you give ownership to the uh, local villages they own the plant so they feel that this project is ours so they can operate and maintain easily in future where can be involved now the question is the where community can be involved during the um, uh, um, uh, micro hydro project construction in the planning stage for better understanding about load profile future growth local villages can help for planning of your project implementation of project locally available resources what are the local available resources there what are the manpower available labor availability is there so these are the thing that local villages can uh, tell you and uh, for operation maintenance of the project uh, so you have to select the operator from the local because to operate the uh, small micro level plants 
nobody from outside uh, the city or outside the village uh, will uh, come in the village so you have to take uh, uh, involvement of uh, locals as operator or technicians and also to to train them for maintaining records accounting like payment to operators tariff uh, the bill collection and the um, uh, bill uh, submission are it is next next so for legally involvement of community you have to take or sign an agreement or an mou with the community so that they will feel that there should be a legal binding between community and the agency who are uh, doing the um, uh, work for them so in in our case we have signed tripartite agreement between village energy committees and the technical support agency and third one is the funding agency or ya government uh, uttarakhand government department so the the tripartite agreement has been signed between three parties so the role and responsibility of all the three parties are uh, in the next slide we will discuss next excuse me sir sorry to interrupt sir you can speed up your delivery sir little bit pardon you can speed up sir presentation okay thank you so these are the role and responsibility of uh, different entities uh, like a uh, village energy committees so for forming their bylaws legal status contribution in capital cost cash kind labor construction of various civil structures purchase and storage of material operation and maintenance record keeping insurance of structure and machinery selection and honorarium of operators or minor repair works these are the main uh, responsibility under the implementation agreement we have we are going to fix Uh, the role and responsibility of technical support agency is preparation of dpr making drawings design tender document specifications inspection during construction testing of project training to village energy committee members and preparation of operate, operation manual and uh, the funding agency responsibilities are monitoring of the project provide guidance to vec quality checking provide funds to vec and technical support agency as per tripartite agreement and support for other livelihood enhancement activities like uh, provide soft loan to the uh, villagers for uh, getting uh, for installing a small cottage industries uh, and other activities in, within the village next now we will uh, discuss uh, the case study of uh, our uh, project called ramgarh micro hydel project in district nainital of uttarakhand uh, this project size is 100 kw in this project two units of 50 kw each was installed in 1995 initially this project was installed in off grid mode and in 2004 when grid came there then this plant was connected with the grid line now this plant is working in dual mode off grid as well as on grid mode the total uh, unit are 2 of 50 kw net head is 50 meter design discharge is 382 liter per second operators uh, uh, are three operators uh, working in uh, one in each shift one electrician is there total households are uh, 372 and the total grid network including st and lt line is about 15 kw km this project is being operated and maintained by ramgarh urja samiti having 12 members from user villages villages 
including 30% women members. There is a, a select uh, election in every five year and they will select the members and choose the chairman and vice chairman of the committee. Next. This project is running by the, uh, the village energy committee and we the 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 tariff the income generated generated in, in income is being uh, uh, sharing between uh, off grid and on grid mode like uh, unit consumed by villagers itself they are paying rupees 2 per unit and that 100% revenue is, has been taken by the village energy committee remaining units are being fed into the grid also when there is no load at in village there so that automatically goes to the grid line and you the utility will pay the committee at that rupees 2 rupees 85 pesa per unit for purchase of electricity and this revenue is being shared by the uh, village energy committee and government 25 percent of revenue received from upcl utility is being provided to you uh, village energy committee and 70 per, uh, percent of um, revenue uh, will be taken by government against the capital investment that was made by the uh, government so uh, in uh, in in nutshell in uttarakhand uh, this is the hilly state of uh, india uh, we have developed about 61 sites ranging from uh, 20 kilowatt to 200 kilowatt covering about 187 villages are in operating condition some of them has been now grid connected as grid has reached there. So our in the last session, uh, Mr. Sagar is asking a question uh, from Nepal that uh, how to convert the off grid project into the grid project. Uh, we have a very good experience in, in Uttarakhand. Uh, whenever grid reach the site, then we, we have diverted all the household to the grid line. Now your project is in isolation mode. You will uh, take the uh, grid synchronization panel installed there and connect it with the grid. This investment for grid synchronization you can make by from government side or from villager side or you can you can give that project on lease basis long term lease basis to a private uh, investor private uh, entity as is where is basis uh, our and the allo the allocation of that plant is based on the reverse tariff based bidding like if you are getting rupees 3 from utility for selling the electricity so you will fix rupees 3 and you ask for discounting that uh, tariff uh, from the private uh, developer if low if, if a developer is giving you is asking you from you a rupees 2.5 rupees 2 or five pesa, 50 pesa then you can uh, uh, give that project to the uh, on lease to the private de developer that will operate and maintain since um, uh, 7 plus 3 years or total 10 years and you will provide rupees 2.5 to them and you will get 50 pesa the the margin between um, uh, UPCL and then so uh, so that 
so that uh, that is the lease based uh, uh, project uh, so we Tragi, are sorry yeah. to interrupt you because we are already jumped up by 15 minutes my request to you that please hurry it up and take the questions you know okay okay uh, we are already up so by 15 next, minutes next now now i am going to finish my uh, next so these, these are some the some of the photographs where when the villagers the life change uh, when there is a um, uh, hydro projects has been installed in their sites uh, the the tv is watching by the children and uh, others next the shop also opening in uh, during night times next late night working by women in the in the villages next business activity during night like uh, the uh, milling and the carpentry and other 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 shops are open next women's also working in night uh, time business activities these are some of the business activities also carpentry shop carpenter is also working in night so this relate to the income generating and employment in the within the village so this is all thank you for patient hearing now you can ask question okay thank you thank you very much sir for your detailed presentation so i would like to take only one question uh, mr nomis are there Hello. explanation like that but sri lanka also has had a lot of hydro projects about 400 village connected hydro projects as well as about 400 megawatts of small hydro at the moment you explain about the target you explain you explained about the clearances and i would rather like uh, mr tula to request uh, sri lanka sustainable energy authority mr uh, Padmadeva to explain the clearances in Sri Lanka that is required, which is a little different to what is the context in India. And that is mainly for the benefit of the Sri Lankan participants, uh, which is in large numbers today. Okay, okay I'll say it. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Namis. Uh, thank you, Arun Kumar, sir. I am also one of the students. Uh, okay. Uh, one of the Sri Lanka is the mini hydro is the most developed at the moment and off grid sector is uh, almost uh, now is not functioning in the frequently because all all those village are 100% uh, uh, electrified few off grid site is uh, village level are operating uh, mainly mini hydro projects uh, uh, required required approval is the first first of all the all the government uh, uh, regulatory body in sustainable energy authority to request the first application submit after that they get the Greek concurrence in the utility company utility uh, Zilon electricity board and uh, after the get the environment clearance process regarding environmental authority and uh, irrigation department uh, other than forest and one in uh, forest uh, wildlife department and divisional secretary in the low water right water water respite and land clearance agencies and related to the local government uh, uh, agencies uh, the regarding this approval complete and submit to the sustainable energy authority to the with full feasible report after that we issue the energy permit uh, after the energy permit and the developer get the Generation license in the public utility commission. Then, after signing the PPA in the, with uh, utility in Ceylon City Board, that the process, the approval, and final stage. Uh, we give the approval construction period, it's the energy permit uh, construction period within uh, after the energy permit, two years period, get the uh, finish the construction in the project. Uh, that's close. Thank you, sir. Thanks okay. for the opportunity. Okay, thank you, sir, for sharing your insight. So uh, now I would like to invite Arun Kumar, sir. Maybe he's having some uh, presentation slide, and 
is going to tell about some problem uh, like availability of the site, license allotment concession, clearance and acquisition, financing and equipment availability, local problem, and is going to cover. Let's start with it, sir. Uh, thank you, Padalji, and thank you, uh, Mr. Tyagi. Uh, now, this hour, our aim is to discuss the problems normally faced by the hydropower developer, the small or commercial scale or small scale and everything. Uh, I was just, uh, I learned, I mean, I was listening, uh, Mr. Tyagi, about that. Uh, what happened used to be, you know, earlier the off grid project used to have the generator without having any kind of uh, you know provision of grid connectivity so for the last 10 15 years we are educating everybody that you must though you may not be having a grid connection today but when the grid is extended because all over the world globally grid extension is on a on a war footing level so grid extension is being and when the grid comes those projects should not get dysfunctional well, I saw one case, even uh, one project, even two years later. I mean, the project was commissioned only two years before, and the grid reached two years later, and then they said, "Okay, namaste." You know, no, no, no project project will not operate. So that kind of situation should not happen because those projects uh, are very much can be operated through the grid connection, grid extension. So that one point I would like to say has been recommended in many of the guidelines, many of the standards. And we strongly request all of you to take a note of that, that these things should happen. Now, I will be uh, presenting uh, uh, the problem because I have been in the morning session. I have requested the participant to write some mail and uh, to write some problem. So I saw one, uh, one, uh, one in a box. I found that there was a, uh, you know, uh, one was uh, uh, prop placed in the box there that we are working on an off-grid grid Pico hydro power plant in the Southeast Asia, uh, South East area of Bangladesh and in the hilly area. Of course, there are five communities, uh, some area common canal. Everybody is thinking that if the hydro power start working, they won't get any water downstream. We are not yet started installing anything, just side her way. Uh, so I want suggestion in this regard, how to make this hydro power without risking water supply. First of all, on a canal fall, there is no storage of any kind of water. So if you put a turbine, so that you must have a bypassing arrangement. That means in case machine is not running, all hydropower plants, whether it's a one kilowatt or whether 1,000, 10,000 megawatt, there always are the spilling arrangement. So that means bypass arrangement. So in case the water does not go to the turbine, the water should continue to run. So you can show the many examples which we have. You can also uh, make sure that uh, this will be uh, without any, you know, bypassing will be there. So bypass can be done without any manpower involvement, like uh, so that there's no uh, failure, fail safe should be there. So you can have a either a automatic things or there's no what electricity. So you can put a uh, Ogi spillway kind of thing, so it will water will certainly will flow downstream. So that kind of fear or that kind of apprehension should be removed by taking some examples. And if you like, I can show you some example. I can send you because I have your email ID. I can send you some uh, you know some uh, photographs of such things happening. So that should not be any problem. So you have to remove this apprehension by showing them uh, some examples. So this is what answer I'd like to give to you, Mr. Shoman. And then I would like to have one very quick, these are very small questions, but though they are part of the design, so my colleague should be able to take, but since these are very small questions, uh, how to determine the loss in the concrete canal? See, the slope is a, is, a, is a head loss, friction loss. In open channel, the slope of the water at one side to another side is actually nothing but uh, the friction slope. And similarly, in a pipe flow, the friction slope is that you know when you get a pressure so this is uh, in open channel uh, this friction slope is you measure the level that becomes your uh, friction slope or the manning equation which is a very famous manning equation or change equations people use it and also you said that is the governing rule for determining the volume of four by time 
Actually, none of you have scheme. This is also a design problem. But uh, since it has come today itself, I thought I'll mention it. So this is the volume of the four bay tank is not any rule. I have got one student has conducted a study about 30 four bay tanks he has found out, which have been constructed recently. And he found out that from 30 seconds to five minutes was the storage for different uh, you know, four bay tank. So that is nothing hard and fast rule. Two minutes is also not hard for but just to start where some kind of figure has been given. But a rule of thumb could be that whatever the volume of slow at pen stock, you know, whatever the volume of pen stock, so that in case some exigency happens in the case of your turbine or something, that you are able to send the signal at the you know four bed tank so that water can be stopped or something like that. Uh, but I would like to say there is no hard and full rule. You can have two minutes, you can have one minute. Of course, it is a cost, but better it more it is better because it will give a possibility of settling the sed sediment and also settling the you know trash which keeps on moving. So those are the small things which uh, will come. There's no that there's no fixed rule. We have printed the guidelines. Uh, we have published the guidelines in 2013-14. They are available on our website. You can download them. Uh, so these guidelines uh, also gives you more clarity on that. So with this, uh, I would like to now take up the question, uh, take up this uh, discussion part. Since uh, some of you have written it, and I thought I'll I'll take it up here. But now I will be now taking up uh, in this manner. Uh, so like this, 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 and this is where I'm going. I hope we'll, uh, we are having this session for discussion on the problem being faced by SSP sector. And so, um, one second, please. Uh, I would like to say, I'll run quickly. These are the common problems of any hydropower project. Availability of site from the government, because in most of the uh, country, the water or the site belongs to the government. Water belongs to the government. So if you want to develop a hydro project, you need to have the site. And these sites may not be there in the their uh, you know in their uh, uh, potential sites. These may not the, nobody might have done any survey on that. And if somebody knows it, but nobody may having the details of this project. So this is where how to get these sites. So which are the good sites? And second thing is then if at all there, how to obtain the license, allotment, and concessions. You know, these are the very common problems you face. And then who, if at all, when you do everything, then who are the reliable consultant? Because in-house capacity, most of the time in a small scale hydropower is not there. You may be knowing something, but to have a project completely, you need to have a reliable consultant. Of course, if you have a good knowledge, like Mr. Pottle can design a hydropower plant very well because he's already a master's in uh, in this subject. So, but at the same time, he requires assistance. He requires good uh, consultant. He requires good uh, surveyors, good investors. You know, those people, he requires a good team with him. Bankable and feasible report, uh, a good quality report actually puts you in a good position. If you do not have a good quality report, it will put you in a highly bad situation. So don't cut short of time on this. Then the clearances, this is the longest time which takes in the uh, in our sec in our uh, sector. This takes a lot of time, too much time. I mean, this is time wise, it is a very high time. And land acquisition, this is another one. The private land, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's difficult. You know, sometimes it's difficult also because a lot of people try to twist your arm. If you know, they know that this is a project is going to come up and they know that without this, the project cannot take off, so that they try to twist the arm. Then the government normally is just not that big deal, but the forest is the one which takes deal because forest laws are quite stringent in most of the countries, and people are very you know quite careful on that, quite uh, sensitive toward this. So these are the, that is also time consuming. The financing, this is also an important. But nowadays, since I said that, I gave an example in the morning about Sri Lanka where. Before 2000, the financing was not coming easy, but later on, financing became easy. Uh, so that's why the project came up in a lot. A lot of paper uh, project came in. Equipment availability could be a question in many countries, but many nowadays, uh, this has become a global market. It's today global. 
the only thing is that uh, even if you prefer from the global uh, there is a good chance that you should have the in house or local uh, issues which can be dealt by i mean the problems of uh, small problems that can be dealt by the local uh, you know manpower the local problems while execute most of the sites are in the remote areas and there the people can come and then sometimes they disturb it or sometimes they feel that as you know uh, example what uh, mr uh, suman uh, you know mahbub has uh, just uh, mentioned in his memorandum that they have a fear that if the turbine is there then they will not get the water you know so these are the very common uh, apprehensions which happens in the world and moreover these are the remote areas many times literacy is not very strong in that area and this kind of problems are there every part of the world it's not only uh, yeah, your company or x country or y country anywhere you do this kind of thing happens the good contractors contractors you know getting a good contractor and construction quality is also helped because i have seen in a project like 16 megawatt project has been washed away because of the poor con poor construction quality and it was very horrible that the responsible engineers could not see even what is the river you know deposits or what is that and that has been there power efficient though is an issue but i would say that this quite relatively easy but still it is issue and once the project is commissioned then you get the money from the electricity uh, to whom you are sold the electricity so these are the common problem and i would like to request all of you please come up and share your thought process or your problems which you might have come so that this become a sharing of uh, your experience with other colleagues so that becomes a, a nice platform to understand and if we had acquired like uh, mr suman has put in a an issue and i said that there are very examples and when you when you show the examples because then the people digest much easily so similar can you think of some problems or where you face something and you can explain to us and let's say debate together uh, with all people are here all experts are there so we can discuss this thing and i for this region in this programs i have kept we have kept scheduled deliberately some time for the discussion you know even one hour kind of discussion we prepare so i all, urge all of you please come forward with your issues with your issues with your apprehensions even if you are a new in this field you must give some apprehensions good or bad don't worry every apprehension is uh, as good as you know uh, because carrying that apprehension in your mind is the worst thing so don't think as a teacher as a trainer or as a teacher for us every apprehension has got a work don't consider that oh, it's a, a bachcho wali hai you know it's not like childish no kidish everything any apprehension has got serious adultness because that bothers you and that may bother others also so i request to uh, urge upon you so please come and uh, tell us about uh, one or two or few issues of yours and you are open so you raise your hand i will call the name yeah. and then please come if you don't speak i will i have the list of the name i will call the name then you have to speak sir i think th there was sujan achare before maybe sujan achare you want to put some question go ahead please hello yeah 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 sujan where are you bro yes, sir i have a one question mm -hmm. regarding environmental impact So as you know, developed countries have already uh, developed large power plant and industry, uh, but they are seeing less concern over environment. So why uh, they imposed a very strong policy regarding IEA, EIA to the developing countries? Okay, very good question. You see, let me tell you historically, till 1970, nobody knew environment. that time survival was then the electricity should come dam should be built up and uh, the thing is that the project should come on then economy should there of course that should be economically so till 1970 nobody used to talk about the environment so there have been you know then this environmental subject came into existence those projects 
even in the developing world, with those that have been constructed before 70s or 80s, they are now until has never come to us. But what is happening in the modern time? A word, if you speak one word, within five minutes you will find that word will be available in each and every channel all over the world, in the corner of the island also, in corner of the you know headquarters in London or New York, anywhere in your city or see. So today is the time when you talk about any kind of environmental. So this environmental issues came up, resettlement issues started coming up, media started taking much glare. Earlier the media was not that strong. When the TV has come, the, the internet has come. So now you need to have any things we call it sustainable. Sustainability word has been inducted sometime in 87 when Brutal Land Commission uh, you know, came into existence, then they started using the word sustainability. Sustainability does not mean that you don't develop hydropower. Sustainability means you address them, you take care of them, you mitigate them, you make those things where you have negative costs higher than the positive costs. Certainly don't do that anything, you know. And uh, so this is the where uh, uh, if you don't do anything, if you have a cost is very high, negative cost is high, don't do anything. So that imposition, when you saw, uh, talk about it, for example, when you build a dam, then you resettle people because there was a certain people, maybe, you know, they had to be relocated. So is it not the duty that the appropriation, that proper allocation without corruption, without uh, mishandling those people because they had to leave that place, they also had to be re rehabilitate in terms of their professional, their professions, you know, because suppose somebody was doing a labor work and suddenly you ask him, okay, you live in a city. So that is where I would like to say that it's not being imposed. It's not being imposed, but in the thing is that we must do sustainable. I just give an example recently. In Sikkim, you know, we have a state of Sikkim where we have a river Tista. Tista is a very furious, you know, river which has a very high slopes. There are many power plants up and steam and down steam. So there's a Tista five projects came up of 12, I think it's a 500 megawatt. That project has won the heart because it has been done in the sustainable manner. It has got now protocols are available. UNESCO and IHA has brought out some of the protocol. So those protocols should be applied and they should be, you know, seen that and those uh, negative things must be addressed. They should be mitigated. And and uh, you can do wonders also. A project like Narmada Sahagar has been, it's a, it's a run of river project, it's not a storage project, it's a run of river project. Narmada Dam if uh, Gujarat has been one of the good example of how to handle the resettlement policies. But on the other hand, there are many projects in the past which has been the bad example because we have not cared before 70s anything about the environment. So people only talk about that. They don't talk about today. They talk only about the, what happened to that time, you know, 40 years before. Well, 40 years before, the subject was not on the discussion. Now, so that is not imposition, but I would say that be, uh, if you take care of it, you'll be very good. So, Mr. Udara, you have some point to say? Please go ahead. Mr. Udara, you have raised the hand. You have to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, Professor, uh, I'm Udara. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, representing Ceylon City Board, uh, the utility provider in Sri Lanka. Uh, I have a question going in line with what you were mentioning earlier. Uh, say, when it comes to hydro hydropower, is there a way we could measure the environmental and uh, social cost impact financially? If you, if we are to say uh, show someone like uh, like not the direct cost, but the indirect financial and uh, so in, indirect environmental and social impact of uh, this sort of a project. Is there a standard we can use or is there a general calculation? I would say that nowadays carrying out the financial or a calculation to the economic benefits, not the financial benefit, economic benefits, which could be direct, it could be indirect, you know. One is the electricity, um, everybody knows about electricity and also grid stability and those things are, uh, well, they can be calculated very easily. But the, the cost which you talk about, social and environmental costs, there are many examples. There are no fixed rules, but there are stand. There are some methods available through which this calculation can be made. And recently, IHE has launched a protocol, International Sustainability Protocol, through which you can calculate also 
easily and there are these uh, these books are available uh, these protocols are available on the website of iha i urge upon to look at them and if you can also get one of or two of you can get uh, the properly trained in that that's how i say it is possible because people will have everybody would like to calculate in their own way especially those who are not in favor those who job is permanently to obstruct or object they will like to give a figure which are you know too big figure you as a promoter would like to have a, a a you know a reasonable figure so all these things are matters or i would say that there are methods available which are accepted by the international bodies and i would say that uh, please go ahead with them and i will send you some details on the maybe tomorrow i'll share with you uh, thank you very much mehboob you have another question to raise or uh, i go with somebody yes mehboob you have another question because you raise the hand i have another response question um is there any common approximation or any kind of thumb rule for budgeting pico or micro hydro projects yes i would say that you tell me you know uh, you talking about a project site the like screw turbine which i was just mentioning to you you know i would like to say the cost of that turbine because their civil works are very small most of the car cost is the equipment only so you can understand let me put in the dollar something like that so minute dialogue kitna bethega dollar mein dialogue means sat the 28 3000 dollars hai 75 se divide kar de kitna is about 3000 dollar per kilowatt would be a very good price but if you have a good volumes then this cost can be done per kilowatt i'm not talking per kilowatt but this can come down drastically this can come come drastically the overall cost in fact if you see i have published a a a, a, a guide uh, not a guideline is a report on benchmarking of cost of small hydro that's available on the website if you like i can bring it out again there in 2015 what we did we have the, taken the data for 240 for just large and small on the recent time only not of the past time only between 2005 to 2015 and we collected data from the banks from the project owner and then we worked out the cost and we found so something like that uh, you know uh, it started in 2005 which were used to be you know if you talk about in today's terms it's about 1.4 million dollar per megawatt 1.3 1.3 1.4 million dollars per megawatt is the cost but please understand indian cost may be relatively cheaper because uh, india has got manufacturing uh, all kind of things and also but i don't think there is a difference between pakistan india and sri lanka and uh, in nepal in fact these costs may be little vary because uh, nepal is little bit uh, you know land wise um, in terms of surface wise they have more little transportation cost but other areas like bangladesh should not be in a big deal and sri lanka certainly not a deal because they have a excellent transportation facilities and pakistan also excellent facilities so i don't think that should be a banis also but a minor variation from 1.4 1.3 to 1.5 million dollars per megawatt should be a good figure on that side please uh, you can visit their website also you can download that report and uh, if you like i can share you the link uh, our website contains a lot of things because we are in this world for the last 40 years and as a government institution and our our uh, objectives also to make the capacity through the training education research so you can find some useful thing over there which of your interest well, thank you yes any other question please because we will be another 4 5 minutes we can devote on that yes there is a question somewhere uh, love tyagi from canada yes mr love tyagi good evening sir so myself love tyagi from peda hello yes i don't you show okay. your why don't you show your video also yes. so that people can see who is love tyagi sure yes then we will have a question from chaminda sir actually yes. uh, recently, after that let mr love tyagi speak first yes please sir actually we have re uh, recently received one proposal for pump storage hydro 
बट गवर्नमेंट ऑफ छत्तीसगढ़ डू नॉट हैव एनी आइडिया अबाउट दैट सो वी आर सर्चिंग फ्रॉम फॉर सम पॉलिसीज सेम प्रोजेक्ट हेल्ड इन इंडिया सो दैट इट विल बी हेल्पफुल फॉर अस फॉर क्रेडा टू इम्प्लीमेंट दिस प्रोजेक्ट ट्वेंटी फाइव मेगा वॉट प्रोजेक्ट uh well uh, though the our class is not for pump storage but since the question was also in the morning so i will very happy to say that uh, pump storage policies are coming up very soon in terms of uh, policy support policy they are not for design policy but if you want to have a design then people like us can be contacted also because we are uh, you know supporting andhra pradesh government for their seven pump storage projects you know we are evaluating their proposal so you can always uh, you know bank out but guidelines in terms of designs there not much of a specific guidelines separate guidelines they are like in a typical storage projects but they are turbines etc we fit a pump turbine they are a little bit diff- different especially we are variable speed or fixed speed because they are two distinct are there and their costing also different their sizing is different and that all depends what kind of input you have if you have a solar input then perhaps a variable will be better if you have a large head variations large area duration more than 20% for the rated head then you could have variable you know variable uh, drive otherwise you should have a fixed drive and the cost difference will be 15 to 20% between these two so there are common things are there and i would suggest that today you should attend a session which will start from 6:30 indian time on the uh, in surprising the pump storage hydrates on one night of congress which is registered session 3 so i'll be also there to speak on behalf of you know in india on that but i say that uh, you as a agency can uh, you know you can discuss with us later if you have any specific issues okay. yes mr chaminda please thank you yeah professor i uh, i heard the, the rough values you mentioned about 1 kilowatt to 1 megawatt plants in dollar terms those are very rough figures can you also shed uh, some light on what would be typical payback periods of these systems like uh, to get some idea like yes payback will depend upon how much you pay him what electricity price you pay him because in india the hydro electricity is not under the bidding that means tariff will be cost plus even if it is 6 rupees if there is a the hpo then people have to buy but unfortunately in the era of solar it's not happening that is the reason where people are uh, small hydro is not getting that kind of space as you should have been but i would like to say payback period normally are in the order of 12 to 20 years bad project may be 20 years good project may be 12 years but i would like to tell you one project i seen the payback was 2 years it was shocking there are special features in fact the owner of that project will speak to you on a, his experience of maintaining the project mr goel is there he has his own project which has got a 4 megawatt 3 megawatt project and he was operating with the had this thing he had a full of water pl of was more than 100% and he got the money back in 2 years and with that money he got a new one more project so cases are very typical but since you asked me a typical figure 12 to 20 years should not be uh, much away but don't expect in 4 years 5 years if you are having it then you are doing a golden you have a golden hand with you rather than a you know but there are many times golden hand also in the high, small scale hydro thank you very much anybody like to otherwise i must close it because then my colleague other colleague will be waiting for the time and now uh, since i'll be joining that world hydro congress uh, session i'll be then uh, you know i'll be taking the questions tomorrow but if you have any immediate questions please do not hesitate to ask right now because this session actually I expected that you will be talking about your problems anybody from i did, i did not hear any question from pakistan because pakistan also has got a lot of small hydro issues and for that region that is a hilly area or it's a canal based projects you have lot of uh, potential and i think is coming up in the private sector though maybe slow but i think uh, you if you have any question please uh, do not hesitate in asking the question Okay, Mr. Porter. I think uh, that session we can close, uh, and then maybe uh, you take over now. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, sir. Now we are going to start a very good topics that is hybridization with uh, 
uh, small hydro power plant that is going to be covered by Professor Himang Sujen. So, uh, uh, Mr. Jain is an assistant professor in Department of Hydro and Renewable Energy, IIT Rukhi. He has over 10 years of combined research and industry experience in modeling and analyzing the impact of integrating high level of renewable energy in power system. And uh, before joining IIT Rukhi, Jain worked as a senior research engineer and research uh, renewable energy in renewable energy laboratory, uh, Colorado, USA. And uh, Dr. Jen also has two and a half years of industry experience having worked at ICF as uh, a senior associate. And, uh, and he has, he holds PhD, MS and BTEC degree in electrical engineering from Virginia Tech, the University of Texas at Arlington and G.B. Pond University of Agriculture and Technology. Please, sir, the floor is open for you. Uh, sorry, I, I'm coming again. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Professor uh, Jain. Uh, see, what we'll do every of, 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 at the end of the class, every day, every after the, the session, we'll be sending you by email a set of 10 questions, multi-objective, multi-option, uh, just to, not to test you, but just to yourself feel that what kind of thing you're learning, you know. So that uh, will be coming to your own email and then you have to just open it and it you are, will allow 10 minutes to answer it. So it will automatically open it. When you open it, it will 10 minutes to start and this is a multi-option, multi-choice are there. So you put in the click and once you click completely it, you will know that how many marks you got yourself and then it will come to me autom automatically. So every day at the end of the class, we will send you a multi-objective or multi-choice 10 questions kind of a, a sheet and this will it will be coming in the name of Kildo. Huh? Kildo, Kildo will be the email sender. That's a, a Google provider, service provider which gives you multi-choice option. Its score also will be seen because we have fed the right answer there and also then when you complete it you will be able to see how much score you have done. Right and uh, obviously if we have any question, we can do it. So that way, every day we will do it. So this will give a good, uh, you know, little bit, say 10 minutes only. So don't think that is a burden, but you will enjoy it. And the time will start when you will open it. And we expect that we will collect everybody who attend this class. So that, you know, while we issue the certificate, at least we know that you are attending the class seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Jan, please. Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pardell, for your kind uh, kind introduction. And uh, um, so let me start by sharing my screen. And then we can take it from there. Um, Mr. Pardell, can you please confirm if uh, you can hear me OK and you can see my slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. OK, great. Um, well, uh, a very uh, good evening to all the participants. Uh, I think we have had a very productive day so far. And uh, I'm going to, and since this is the last uh, presentation of the day, I I'm going to keep it short and sweet, but I, I still want to convey some key and uh, some interesting facts uh, on hybridization opportunities that you may have with the small hydro and medium hydro and micro hydro plants. Um, it will be not just about these plants alone. I'll also go over some concepts on what hybrid power plants are, why they have been been gaining a lot of interest and traction in, in the power systems community in general and with all different uh, generation developers. And uh, also give you a couple of examples, uh, including one where uh, hybridization uh, efforts were done uh, with run of the river plant being hybridized with battery storage. So uh, let, without taking more time, let me just uh, directly uh, dive into the, the lectures content. So uh, I'll talk about what hybrid power plants are, why there has been interest in developing these plants, what are the different ways in which you can classify them, and then focus on a couple of examples of uh, hybridization, both uh, that have been implemented uh, on the field and then uh, those that have been tested in a laboratory setup that sort of mimics the conditions you would encounter in the field. Um, 
so before I get into those examples, let me just talk about some conceptual things uh, uh, at the beginning. So if we talk about the definition of a hybrid power plant, it, it is very simple. Whenever you have two or more generation resources that are operated as a single asset, that's when you can call it a hybrid resource or a hybrid power plant. So the important thing to remember here is that um, we are talking about two or more generation resources, each of which is capable of being operated as an independent generation resource. So by this definition, if you have a solar PV plant, let's say that is DC coupled uh, to battery storage, then you would not call it a hybrid power plant because the battery by itself cannot connect to the grid and provide uh, power. On the other hand, if you have solar PV generation and a battery generator with their own inverters, then you can and you control them as a single asset. That's when you would call it a hybrid plant. So uh, now to get into further details, you can uh, you can also think about a hybrid plant as being comprised of co-located generation assets, or they might be remotely located generation assets, in which case you might also call them a virtual hybrid power plant, but you would still control those two assets uh, as a single entity. Um, now, the concept of hybrid energy systems or hybrid power plants is not necessarily new. In the context of off-grid power systems, a uh, lot of research has already been done, and uh, our department, the Hydro and Renewable Energy Department, uh, has also worked a lot um, uh, on this topic. But what is new in the context of hybrid power plants is that they are also now being conceived for um, uh, remote um, uh, for, for, for grid connected systems. And, and, and that's, that's where a lot of research is currently taking place. Now let me come to the motivation for interest in hybrid power plants. So what you see on, your, uh, uh, on the slide is, is, a, is a picture uh, from a paper that I published along with uh, uh, Dr. Brian Mathias Hodge and other uh, researchers at Enril and in, and in Europe on what are the challenges in integrating 100% inverter-based renewable energy systems in the grid. And the reason I put this uh, figure here is to show you that the amount of renewable energy has grown quite a bit over the years. So on the y-axis, you see the percentage of wind and solar, which is a variable uh, and intermittent uh, energy resource, an uncertain energy resource. And on the x-axis, you see the size of the system. So for small systems, very small systems, you even have situations where you get even 100% of your power at certain times of the day uh, from wind and solar. And then as you the size of the system increases, that percentage goes down, but you still see for 60, 70 gigawatt ERCOT system in, in, in the United States, you get sometimes even 55% of instantaneous power from variable resources. And your small, medium micro hydropower plants uh, also have uh, variability similar to what you observe in wind and solar, although the exact nature would, would be different, but still uh, there is a lot of this variability that grid uh, operators have to contend with. And that is why there is a lot of interest in firming up this variability, reducing it, and helping improve the reliability and the reliable operations of the grid. And that's one of the main reasons what is driving this interest in hybridization of power plants. Then there are also better economics that you can get with hybridization. Um, so some of the benefits that you might get is extended duration of plant operation. And then you can easily conceive that let's say you have a solar PV plant and a wind generation asset, then you can also provide power from that generator at night. Um, you can bid in capacity markets because you have uh, some ca firm capacity that you can, that you can claim uh, or even or, or say larger firm capacity that you can claim compared to uh, before. Um, ancillary services also become available to you. So whether it is in, uh, regulation up, regulation down, spinning reserve, non-spinning reserve, all those capabilities get offered to you once uh, you firm up the generation of your variable renewable resource. And finally, if you talk about grid restoration and, and emergency support services, even those uh, can be provided um, based on, um, uh, for, because you have a hybrid plant. So if you talk about Black Start or grid restoration support, that also becomes possible. So these are the various reasons why there is an increasing interest in hybridization with power plants. Um, as far as classification uh, with uh, of hybrid power plants is concerned, there, there is no standard definition, but the way I think about it, there are two ways in which you can do it. Uh, by the resources. So depending on what resource you combine, you can say it's a solar PV plus wind hybrid resource. You can also add storage to it. Similarly, you can have a small medium micro hydro plant with storage. And I'll give you an example of, 
of a, of a research project that has been going on for the past five, six years, where some run of the river plants have been hybridized with battery storage. Um, you can also add solar to it. That increases the amount of generation that you can get. Um, and then you can also hybridize a small hydropower plant with biomass based generation. So it really depends on what assets are available to you in a particular location and what makes most economic sense based on which you will decide what resources to pick. Um, hybrid power plants, one thing that you will notice that it makes more sense for hybrid power plants if you have at least one variable renewable resource. So in all of these cases, you either have solar PV, wind, uh, a small uh, mini or uh, mini micro hydropower plant. So all of these assets have at least one uh, variable resource that you would like to hybridize with a more firm generation asset. Then if you also look at it from generation technology point of view, then there could be um, uh, all inverter based generators that are hybridized. So let's say solar PV and battery or solar PV and wind. You could have hybridization using inverter based and synchronous generators. So an example where you have a run of the river hydro plant, a small plant hybridized with battery storage. That would be one example. Or you can have only synchronous generators. Like I mentioned, a small hydropower plant with say biomass based generators. So depending on the technology that you choose, your control strategy would differ as well. So you would all appreciate that we have a far more experience operating generators, uh, operating systems with synchronous generators. So one would think that if you have different uh, synchronous machine based assets uh, hybridized together, then it would be easier to plan and operate such a system and control such a system. Whereas you have limited experience with inverter based assets. So you need more uh, complex controls uh, for hybridizing plants with inverter based generators and synchronous generators being combined together. And that's that is actually an active area of research today uh, as far as hybridization is concerned. So with this general discussion, let me now spend a little more time on uh, an example of, of a research activity which is progressively uh, transforming into field test and field experiments is the hybridization effort of run of the river plants with uh, battery storage. And not just battery storage, they've also tried to put supercapacitors and flywheels and to see what kind of benefits do they get in terms of grid reliability and also in terms of improved uh, plant operations and improved uh, economics uh, of the run of the river plant. So as I mentioned, this research has been performed over the past five years by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the Idaho National Laboratory in the United States in collaboration with Idaho Falls Power. Um, and the motivation has been that can we improve the dispatchability of run of the river hydropower plants in the United States if we do this hybridization? And there were several aspects that they considered. And the reason I put these aspects here is that in case some of you have interest in, uh, in this kind of an hybridization activity, these uh, aspects that they consider give you uh, an opportunity to look into what are the different things you should consider before going for such a hybridization project. So the first thing that they did was they looked at what is the technical and financial feasibility of hybridizing run of the river plants with uh, energy storage. Uh, once that was done, they worked on developing a controller that would coordinate the operation of multiple run of the river plants and storage assets and operate them together as a single resource. Uh, once, that once that controller was developed, then they also uh, model this entire operation in the Cheers model from the Argonne National Laboratory, again in the United States. This model essentially helps you schedule your uh, hydropower plant uh, for operation with the grid. So they had to modify it and include incorporate the features to include energy storage as well. Um, then they also perform a lot of simulation case studies uh, to look at that if they hybridize four run of the river plants with battery, supercapacitors, or flywheel storage, what are the revenue benefits that they get? And that is what I will talk about in the in the next slide and show you what benefits did they actually get. And finally, there is an ongoing field test uh, uh, in progress um, where uh, Black Start using run of the river uh, and supercapacitors bay hybrid plant is being done. So for those who, who, who most of you must be aware of what Black Start is, but basically that's the process by which you try to re-energize the grid um, once uh, a large part of the grid loses power um, because of a man-made event or a natural disaster or whatever the cause may be. So they're also trying to see, can they use this hybrid asset to provide Black Start support and grid restoration support? And if you want more details about it, I have put the reference here 
you are free to to go there, download this uh, presentation, and you'll have a lot more information about what all that was done in this uh, research effort. So uh, let me now also uh, uh, talk about uh, what are the benefits that they got in terms of revenue increases when they did this hybridization and did the simulations. So what you see here is there are three different price profiles that they simulated in software, uh, just to see, uh, just sort of a sensitivity analysis to see do we get the same benefits or is there a wide range of benefits do we get if we change different price profiles uh, uh, for these assets? And for each price profile, you have three bars. The first one is always what you get in terms of your revenue if you only operated your hydro plant or another river plant. But if you add battery storage or you add flyway, what that does to you is it gives you an opportunity to generate energy from the storage and feed it back to the grid. It allows you to provide regulation up and regulation down ancillary services, meaning that if, if uh, for grid balancing purposes, you need to increase your generation, you can. If you need to reduce your generation, you can in a short span of time. It provides you spinning reserves, meaning that if you have a large generator in your system trips, then this hybrid asset could provide uh, energy as a, as, a, uh, as a compensation and prevent your frequency from going down uh, below uh, accepted levels. And then non-spinning reserve as well, that you can quickly bring this hybrid plant back online so that uh, you can provide uh, uh, grid support uh, as needed. And because you could provide all these capabilities, you saw they saw a revenue increase of 12 to 16 percent um, because of hybridization. So I think that indicates an, uh, an, uh, an interesting opportunity for making the, uh, the, the plant uh, a, a battery, a run of the river plant more useful to the grid and at the same time uh, make more economic sense of operating that plant with some storage assets. And again, I have highlighted a link here where you can get more details about this project if you are uh, interested. Um, I will also now talk about another example, not necessarily including a hydro uh, uh, project, but I think still again something that's useful because I'll show you how well they were able to match the scheduled uh, uh, the, the the schedule that this plant was supposed to follow, even though they had wind turbine and solar PV, both variable assets. But because they had battery storage, they were able to balance out all these fluctuations. So what you see here is an entire experimental setup, which is available at the Flatirons campus of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where on the right side you have a large grid simulator that can provide up to 7 MVA of power and about six times that uh, short circuit current. And then it connects through a transformer to this hybrid asset resource comprising of solar PV inverters, a battery storage and wind turbine. And as I mentioned, each is a full generator asset on its own. And the entire plant is operated together using this flex hybrid power plant controller, which controls this entire plant, their set points so that you can get the desired response. And it interacts with a simulated grid using this rodeo tool, again developed by uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Now, the, pa the power network that they simulated was uh, the very well known IEEE 9 bus system. It's a publicly available synthetic network model. And all of these hardware in the loop simulations were performed using the real time digital simulator or RTDS. And what, what they found as a result of this hybridization was that if they had used any of the plant by itself, whether it's PV, whether it's battery or PV or wind, the capability curve, that is how much real and reactive power that you can provide in normal times, was much lesser than what you would get from the plant as a whole. So obviously your real and reactive power capabilities improve as a result of hybridization. And what that does to you is it provides you the opportunity to, to dispatch the plant better. And here, as I mentioned again, this is an example of wind and solar PV, but nothing stops you from getting the same benefits if you have a small, medium micro hydropower plant as well that is being hybridized with a battery asset. And what you see here is that even though uh, you have a lot of variability in the wind and this total wind variation is a lot, because you have battery power here, it is compensating for that wind variability. And as a result, your scheduled power and the plant power they match almost exactly. And that gives you the ability to firm up your power generation and, and bid in other capabilities that you cannot uh, as a single uh, uh, wind, as a single hydropower plant, uh, run of the river plant by itself, or as a wind or solar plant by itself. 
So again, uh, another reference here for you to go into the details and look at all that they did in case you are interested. Um, now, I think we are getting very close to the end of the presentation. So one thing I want to highlight here, which might which 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 makes sense in the context of small, medium, micro uh, hydro plants is that we need to understand that synchronous generation is quite different from inverter based generation. But if we hybridize a small hydropower plant with solar and storage, uh, then there is a possibility that we can exploit the benefits that both synchronous machines and inverter based generators offer and at the same time minimize the negatives that these two technologies have. So if we talk about synchronous generators, one of the biggest pluses of this technology is that we have several years of operational experience. In fact, several decades of operational experience. We get natural inertia, so frequency can be maintained better. We also get high short circuit current, and that means your protection systems can work better. At the same time, with inverter based generators, it's a relatively recent technology. There is no natural inertia, although you can synthesize it. Um, there is a relatively low short circuit current that you can get from these resources unless you intentionally oversize an inverter, which is not typically done. And then you get very fast response compared to synchronous generators. So I gave you an example of trying to use a hybrid asset for Blackstar. So Blackstar typically takes a very long time in today's context. But if you have these inverter based assets hybridized with a synchronous resource, you might be able to provide that large current that you need for uh, energizing the grid, but at the same time, get black black start fast. So that's an advantage that you can get. And that's where I think there's a promising area of research and development on trying to hybridize small, medium, micro hydropower plants that have synchronous machines or conventional machines attached to them with solar and storage assets so they get, you can get best of both worlds as when you hybridize them. Um, then I think this is this is a very interesting report that I that I found and thought I'll share with all of you on um, what are the uh, wh what are the steps that you need to follow to develop hybrid power plants. There's a lot of detail here on the opportunities, the challenges for hybridization. Uh, it's a very recent report, so I would encourage you to to go in and review it. But basically, there are three things that need to happen. First is selection of hybridization technologies, and that's that's something I already talked to you about, that you need to pick a resource or a set of resources that you want to hybridize, let's say, with a small, medium, micro hydropower plant. And the objective could be that I want to improve the reliability metric uh, of an off-grid power system. I want to uh, have, uh, have the ability to bid in the ancillary service market uh, when, uh, wherever they are available. I want to provide black start, whatever the, the objective has to be. But that has to be clear at the beginning so that you choose the right technologies for hybridization. Then uh, software such as Homer and Reop, they can help you uh, make these selections because they can tell you what kind of energy balance conditions do you get once you hybridize your system and what improvement do you get compared to operating one generator by itself. Then you come to design and optimization of a plant. So for example, you might have a consideration that if I am uh, trying to hybridize let's say solar PV and wind turbines uh, with a small micro hydropower plant, what, how should I design it so that wind turbines do not shade my solar PV and I don't lose on uh, the amount of power generation that I can get from solar PV assets. Um, and finally, you have to also talk or think about operation and control. You already saw in the couple of examples that we discussed that there was a central controller that was developed to optimize the operation of the plant and operate it as a single asset. So you need to think about various considerations such as what are the multiple time scales at which I want to provide a service? Am I interested in inertia? Am I interested in Miller's level energy balancing? And that would determine what kind of operation and control strategy uh, you would adopt. And as I mentioned again, this is a very good reference that I, I encourage you to, uh, to, to go over if, you, if hybridization is of uh, interest to you. So finally, um, looking forward, I, I, I feel that there is an immense interest in, in hybridization, particularly for solar PV and storage, but that doesn't mean that there is not an opportunity for hybridization with small micro and medium hydropower plants. Uh, uh, in, in fact, as I mentioned earlier, these plants, when, in, when uh, hybridized with inverter-based assets, could actually uh, provide more benefits uh, than say even a conventional plant that is available today that is run from fossil uh, based uh, generation resources. And of course, there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Um, do we have suitable terrain available for hybridization? Is virtual hybrid plants an, a better option to consider in the SAC context? Um, what is the financial vi viability of these, uh, these projects? I think there were already certain questions asked on the financial aspects 
today and there will be more such topics coming up in the training uh, uh, in the next few days. And what are the policies and regulations in place to encourage hybridization? Um, certainly at today, storage is expensive, for example. So uh, does it, will it make any practical sense for me to invest in this technology today? Or maybe in five years from now, because battery prices are dropping very rapidly and there is a lot of interest in using battery storage in general. So a lot of these are interesting questions that need to be answered. And I, as a researcher and an academician, uh, I'm really looking forward to answer these questions. So uh, with this, I, I end the presentation and I, I open it up for any questions that you might have um, uh, on this topic. So does anybody have any question? OK, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for the uh, very interesting presentation. Just a quick thought, uh, a comment to get, get from you. Like, so if when we go for hybridization, uh, for instance, like battery storage, of course, I believe they can power up for a certain time. Mm -hmm. But uh, can you just shed some light on what exactly you mean by flywheel storage? Like, is it going to be running uh, over the hours? And what is that? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, that's a that's a very good uh, question that you asked. So there is a difference between the power and and energy densities of battery storage, flywheel storage, and supercapacitors. So you might have seen in the in the slide that there was a supercapacitor based hybridization also happening. Um, with battery storage, you can get much longer duration for power, um, but the amount of power that is available to you in quick time that is smaller. And you can get more power quickly from from flywheels and even higher power from supercapacitors. So depending on what kind of uh, uh, need you have. So let's say you want to mainly focus on let's say you have a small off grid uh, uh, community, right? And you have a large motor load there that you want to power and you want to provide very a lot of power very quickly to that motor load when you're trying to run it, when you're trying to start that, that motor. Then it might make more sense to have a supercapacitor versus say a flywheel. But if your objective is to provide say five hours of a uh, certain amount of power continuously uh, at, at the desired value, then you might want to go for battery storage compared to say a flywheel. So it just depends on what objective you have because a flywheel would uh, take energy to rotate very fast and then it would act as a turbine for your generator to generate electricity. And you would always condition that electricity with power electronics. So depending on what kind of your, what your objective is, what time scale uh, you are looking for, uh, for providing certain benefits with hybridization, that would really determine whether you go for battery storage or flywheel or supercapacitors, or maybe a combination of all of them. So in that sense, uh, just to clarify further, so you mean uh, if we're going to have battery with flywheel, let's say, so in that uh, case, flywheel uh, should be uh, running in the idle mode, right? Or we're going to yeah. power it. Right, right. I mean, it could be it, it could be running, uh, it could be charging or it could be running in the idle mode. And then when you need it, you have the right control available to get the energy out of that flywheel. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chaminda, sir, uh, for your queries. Now, I would like to uh, ask the question to Red Warner. Please, sir. Uh, sir, I think you might want to unmute yourself. You may have to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, There's a little bit of disturbance that we are getting. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, thanks, sir. Uh, sir, your, your voice is still on and off. Okay. Sure. 
sir, sir may i give you a suggestion sir maybe you can you may you might want to try to speak directly into the laptop instead of the headphone if that might work okay and i uh, uh, can be the, the hybridization there is a you talk to the solar solar can be possible commercial biogas by the yeah yeah i think i think bio biogas based uh, hybridization is also possible because as i as i gave, mentioned uh, in in the presentation you might actually get a benefit of operating two synchronous machines in parallel for which you have more operational experience so i think uh, that is certainly a possibility um, it's not necessary that you have to have battery storage or you know super capacitors or flywheels only if it makes more economic sense i think Uh, with biomass, and if you have, if you can maintain the power levels of that biogas based power plant, for example, then I think it it serves the same purpose. So I don't see a reason why you cannot uh, hybridize using a biogas based power plant. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, please. Yes. Uh, one more, just follow up question. Uh, based on your experience can you uh, just uh, comment on uh, because if you consider a battery there's definitely a, um, uh, uh, at the end of their lifetime there will be a carbon footprint and uh, mm -hmm. if you consider a flywheel also and running and all these things will come but uh, compared to that how about the pump storage how you compare the future of like any any uh, any uh, thoughts you can share with us um i i so so i i can give you an example uh, that might it, it's not directly related to small hydropower but i'll give you an example for, from a project that we that i worked at when i was at the national renewable energy laboratory in the united states um so we, we were talking about a very high variable renewable energy penetration in the grid and uh, whenever you get to a very high levels of say solar and wind Uh, let's say 40%, 50%, or even higher. Let's say 70%. Then you really start to look at grid-level energy storage, right? And your batteries that are available today can only provide you so much power. I mean, so much energy for say eight hours, ten hours. But what do you do beyond that, right? And and uh, let's say you want to get 500 megawatt of of, of power uh, for ten hours. I think at at that level, I think pump storage is probably the the only major realistic asset available to you to balance the grid. so uh, pumped hydro storage i think is a very good resource available to you because not only does it provide you energy balancing but being a conventional generation resource or or being coupled to a conventional generator it also provides you other benefits uh, you have you get much higher short circuit current out of it so you don't have to change your protection systems that much because one of the major issues with inverter based assets is that they only provide 10 to 20% over current capability so if you have a relay that is set up then how do you make sure that the relay doesn't uh, create nuisance tripping it doesn't trip on a normal overload when it should actually trip on a fault right so it provides you that overcurrent capability it provides you inertia so you need that to maintain your frequency better so if you are talking about uh, in today's context i think pumped hydro storage has depend depending on if you are favorable geography you need a certain geographical conditions right to to develop the pumped hydro storage facility but if you do then i think as if you want to integrate large amount of renewable energy in a decently sized system then this is a very good asset to have i don't have the exact cost comparisons between how much would it cost to use battery versus say pump storage but based on what we saw in that project pump storage was a very critical asset in making sure that we reach very high renewable penetration Uh, in fact if you want to go over some of these details there is a there is a project this this project was called LA100 so transitioning los angeles to 100% renewable energy by 2045 so uh, it's a publicly there are a lot of publicly available reports on this project so you might want to peruse them uh, just just go over them and see uh, there are a lot more very interesting details available on how do you achieve very high renewable penetration and hydro plays a very important role there thank you very much i am from sri lanka university of rohuna we are doing okay. a research these days uh, on mpl on um i think mr chamenda we lost you i guess we lost your audio i believe uh 
Mr. Pardil, can you hear him? Uh, I just want to make sure. No, 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 no. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But I mean, I mean, uh, he can always send an email to me, or uh, my uh -huh. email is always on the on the presentation, so you can always oh, do yeah. that. So please, anybody, next. Yeah, yeah, yeah Doctor Prasanna, please. Uh, sir, you may you may need to unmute yourself. Switch off the video because it's not that clear. Anyway, uh, now I think uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Professor Jain, uh, this is uh, I think the confusion came uh, this hybrid system and uh, thinking about uh, integrating large renewable energy system isolately into larger grid. And then uh, actually, then we'll have to think about uh, the large pump hydro or something like that. But uh, you are mainly talking about uh, kind of even smaller uh, intermittent uh, uh, yes. system hybridization could help the grid to yes. stabilize the the, the elect electricity quality. So that yes. is, I think, the confusion came. Uh, by that one, so you are mainly talking about the comparatively smaller hybrid system. Yes, yeah. yes, you, you are absolutely right. I mean, um, the, the benefits will be there even in smaller systems for sure. Um, I mean, I mean, if uh, one of the biggest challenges with smaller systems is that you actually get more uh, variability because uh, because you don't get that geographical smoothing. So if you want to, uh, even in your loads, there, there can be more variability there. So if you want to manage that along with, say, you have a solar asset or a wind, let's say one or two wind turbines or a small solar uh, resource, um, then you will have a lot more variability to contend with. And that's where hybridization with uh, in the smaller plant or in a smaller setup as well will also be useful. And uh, uh, this example that I gave you uh, of Idaho Falls, they are relatively small plants. I won't say they are as small as one or two megawatt, but they're relatively small plants with which the hybridization was being attempted. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. Please, the next. Please, the next. Anybody? Who is AMSE? Please. <clears throat> I think there are no participants okay. link. Okay, sir. So we can con conclude today? Yeah, sure, sir. Sure, sir. So, so th thank you very much, Imangshu, for taking us through the very interesting and detailed presentation on this you. hybrid. So, dear participants, with this, we have concluded today technical session for information is uh, notified by Professor Arun Kumar. Uh, we'll be providing you uh, the uh, question MCQ is a evaluation and uh, you are requested to send us and for tomorrow we'll be joining just right after the half an hour than today's time and tomorrow's topics is planning and design and that will be very interesting and that is more technical. So. Thank you for your participation and for your time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all of you. Trial version.